Hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Rattlecast for, uh, what is it, Tuesday, March 10th. We have a great show for you today. As always, Lola Haskins is here. Um, a po- we've published a whole bunch of times in Rattle, and uh, we're looking forward to that. If you have any questions for Lola coming up, I'll leave them in the chat window if you're watching live on YouTube. And before, before we begin, I should say, uh, if you're watching, please do click the like button. Uh, that always helps if you're watching uh, later, if you're just listening through iTunes or any of that kind of thing. Uh, click the like button there, and um, um, that just helps poetry spread around the world, and that's what we're trying to do with these Rattlecasts every Tuesday night, bringing a poet into your living room uh, every Tuesday evening, and I'm so glad you could join us. So we always like to start out with a uh, a warm-up poem, just as everybody trickles in, uh, um, and today I thought we would do, I sort of hit the random button again, which is what I usually do. And um, In America popped up by Dana Getch. Uh, she was the winner of the um, Rattle Chepik Prize a couple years ago. And this is the title poem to her book, In America. Um, so I thought I would play that right now. Uh, here we go. This is In America. In America. Why don't you go to Japan and ask the cats, I said to the TSA agent when she asked if I was Amish, because I believe in answering a non sequitur with a non sequitur. I only said it after I'd been cleared, after I'd been strip searched behind frosted glass, then posted the bitch's face on Facebook along with her name. Maybe being trans is like being Amish. Or maybe I went pale when I missed my flight as security agent Pamela E. Starks conferred with explosives expert Gary Pickering to discuss, based on the, quote, soft anomaly picked up by the body scanner, which of them needs to search me. At one point, she suggested they each take half. I suppose I could have come from Amish country, a place so deep in the heart of America it can't be seen, and delivered to the airport by horse and buggy, an Amish horse, oblivious to traffic. Maybe it's because of my long black dress or makeup that makes it look like I'm not wearing makeup, a goal whose purpose used to elude me, though I totally get it now, But please don't ask. You could go and ask the cats in Japan, though it's bound to earn you a contemptuous frown, by which they mean to say, eat my ass in Macy's window. How do cats in Japan know about Macy's, you must be asking? Beats the hell out of me. They have no tails, did you know? Neither do the Amish. Just kidding. I'm still waiting to hear about the complaint I filed, the one that, along with the viral video of them repeatedly calling me it, shut down the TSA website for three days while they rewrote the rules about me. You could be charged for this, friends warn me, but in America, it can't be libel if it's true. I learned that from the cats in Japan, who, you can ask, though it's best not to disturb them. And that was Dana Getch reading her poem in America, the title mm-hmm. poem from her chapbook, uh, which came out in oh, 2017, Rattle Chapbook Prize selection. Um, she's also the author of Nameless Boy and The Job of Being Everybody, um, as Douglas Gotch back in 2004. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that poem to kick us off. Now, um, Lola Haskins is here, and she will getting to her in just a second. Lola Haskins, uh, she's been in Rattle a whole bunch of times. Um, her most recent book is uh, put on screen uh, right now. Let's see. There you go. This is uh, Asylum by Lola Haskins, Improv- Improvisations on John Clare. Um, Lola Haskins lives in Gainesville, Florida, and skimped in Yorkshire. Her poetry's appeared in The Atlantic, The London Review of Books, London Magazine, a whole bunch of other places. Um, a bunch of poems uh, from this book are in Rattle. So, so just go to rattle.com and Google 
or search for Lola Haskins really quick and you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. Um, she's also been, let's see, she's uh, published 14 collections of poems, a poetry advice book, and a nonfiction book about 15 Florida cemeteries. Uh, Ms. Haskins has been awarded three book prizes, two NEA fellowships, four Florida Cultural Affairs fellowships, the Emily Dickinson Writer Magazine Award from the Poetry Society of America, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, she's retired from teaching computer science at the University of Florida and uh, uh, served from then until 2015 on the faculty of Rainier Writers Workshops. And you can find more of her at lolahaskins.com. That's L-O-L-A Haskins, H-A-S-K-I-N-S.com. And um, here she is, Lola Haskins. Hello, Lola. How are you doing today? I am doing extremely well. Thank you for asking. Um, do you want to just start out with a, with a poem from the book or anything you want to read to sort of kick us off and get us into poetry gear? <laughs> okay, let me think. I'll just do the first poem in the book since I'm not very quick thinking. Okay. And so I need to explain a little bit before I do that. Because the four sections in this book are to each other. All my books pretty much are one piece of music, but this one is four different clashing pieces of music, which is why I used a lunatic to frame it. So the first section is about death, because I thought one should start where we start. So this is called Mortality, very short poem. Every thrown stone falls. But there is a moment first, as it hangs in the air, that the blurred hand that tossed it will not come again, thinks the stone as it flies. And that was Mortality from Lola Haskins' new book from Pitt Press, Asylum, uh, which is right here. Um, that's a great poem to start with because it really represents your style of writing, I think, at least as far as I'm um, you know, as, as far as I think of you anyway, um, there's a really concise way that you write, a really image-based, really deep and rich in metaphor. Um, um, how do you, how do you like approach writing poems? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very distinctive style. You're one of those poets that stands out, um, for having a, a certain style. Um, how do you, how do you engage with poetry? Well, that's a very difficult question. If I knew I could write poems all the time, right? It would be easy. I think I get very struck by something and it haunts me for a while. And then I never know where I'm going. If I knew where I was going, it wouldn't end up a good poem from my own perspective. And so I say whatever comes to my mind about that. And then I'm very uh, tough about not allowing anything in there that doesn't absolutely have to be in there mm -hmm. so, because I like space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Space plays a big role. Um, you know, just blank space on the page and the way everything is framed. Um, do you, so you're saying that you write, you know, much bro more broadly and then narrow down to how concise that, that you write. Is that how it works? No, it depends on the poem. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some poems have stories in them. And so they take a while to tell, but then I realize I don't need all uh -huh. that. But nevertheless, they end up a lot longer than what you're thinking, because some of my books have long, longer poems than that. But what I do if they're quite long in general is I link them mm -hmm. as opposed to having a 13 page poem. Um, so how do you um, um, how did you get into poetry? Um, you, you, I think in your, in your ah. bio, you said that you were a, um, you, you taught computer science, which is an unusual thing for a poet to, to be a professor of. And, um, and I, th well, I've never had a class in it. That's what I was. <laughs> so it's my excuse. <laughs> that's what I was saying. I think you said yesterday when we were doing the pre, you know, test call that you don't have a degree in English, never took an English class. Um, how did you end up writing? Right. How did you end up writing poetry? Well, I mean, I started reading when I was three and I had, um, a very unhappy home life. So I lived in the books and I lived with my sketch pad mm -hmm. and I lived walking on the mountain. I would go, there's a fire road behind my house and I would walk up it and just keep walking. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm very visual. I turned out to be very visual. I see things. I don't just think them. Mm -hmm. I'm not an intellectual in the way that some people are terrific at being. It's not me. I'm all, all heart, you might say. 
But when I was little, I used to write poems and I would illustrate them. Mm -hmm. And I was sent to a convent with nuns. And I remember the very first poem, I think, yes, that I ever wrote. I was like six. And I can still see the illustration. I did it in crayon, <laughs> as you may expect, being six. And it said, you ready for this? I still, I don't know why I remember it. I remember the first three poems I wrote, in fact, but this is the very first one. It's, don't worry, it's not a good poem, but it says, <laughs> my life is like a candle. It burns a steady flame. But when that candle is burnt out, my life will lose its claim. And then it will be lit once more and it will burn again. <laughs> now, to some extent, even at six, it was wishful thinking, but that was what I was taught. Mm-hmm. And I remember the drawing I made of a candle with all this yellow light and stuff. But I memorized poems when I was really little. I mean, I used to memorize things out of A.A. A. Milne. And I would memorize uh, things out of Robert Louis Stevenson. And when I was 11, I had a really great teacher. It was a public school. By then, I wasn't in the convent. And she was wonderful. She understood me. She's the only t- t- teacher that ever saw me. I was very shy. But she uh, she got me. So we had a poetry evening for the parents. And all the kids are counting the number of lines they're going to have to learn, right? Because you get to pick what you memorize. Well, not me, because I memorized my favorite poem, which is The Highwayman. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I can still do it. I mean, I can do every word of it still. And I was only 11 when I memorized how, it. How long is that? Just so, so everybody, you know, watching Oh, it's this. probably four pages, maybe. Yeah, it's a long poem. You know, it's... Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a long poem, but I used to do it to my computer science classes just to shake them up every semester. <laughs> I would do that. Well, they found out it's a good story, you know, mm-hmm. and so they actually listened, and they were mostly business majors, and they were ho- ho-humming immediately, but I said, guess what? You're going to like it, and they did. Mm-hmm. So it was good, and also I recite it when the plane's turbulent, mm-hmm. and that one in My Last Duchess, and this Rudyard Kipling one, it's not the normal ones. It's this one called The Harp Song of the Dane Women. Do you know that one? Yeah, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, but yeah, I know that one, yeah. Well, yeah, it's about a, how the women are, ber- it's a, what is a woman that you forsake her and the hearth fire and the homemaker, et cetera, to go with the gold gray widow maker, mm-hmm. that one. I recite all those things to myself when the plane's turbulent, so I'm lucky. I've got lots of that in my head. But I didn't write, truthfully, you're asking me how I started writing, it all went away when I got to school, 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 mm-hmm. because I'm not an academic in my mind. And it was, as soon as they said this is an academic exercise, I didn't respond. But after I got out of college, I my favorite thing in college in the whole world was Greek theater. And I went to Stanford. They had pretty good faculty, and they had this really good guy who taught Greek stuff. So I went to live in Athens, Greece, and lived above a taverna. Uh, and I wanted to see, I had to see where the theater came from. I had to. And then I started writing bad poetry, and I never stopped. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was probably 21, 22 when I actually started writing with seriousness. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about what John Clare means to this book? Because um, I, I hadn't read it, and I kind of assumed just based on the title that it would be sort of a historical fiction type poems. But they're very personal poems set in the present. And John Clare is sort of a touchstone for you as you go through the book, rather than it being an actual, um, um, you know, his story. Um, so so, so why right. did you choose this? Um, and, and how does that work for you, do you think? This is very specific. I decided because in my writing life, every time I get what I feel is good at something, in other words, it becomes easy, I don't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. because I'm not risking, and I'm not learning, and I'm not going deeper. So I stop. And it's hard, because I have no idea what I'm going to do next. This has happened to me maybe four or five times. And besides which, every time I stop, I'm very specific in the way I write. So sometimes I have an audience for what I'm doing now. And when I do the next thing, they hate it. <laughs> and that's always been true, all, all, all the times I've stopped. So I looked at the stuff I've had published over the years. And There were things that never made it into books because I compose books like music. I don't just put poems from 1963 to 1969 in a book. I don't do that. Uh, So those poems never fit in any of the music I wrote with the other books. But I like them, and so I wanted to keep Mm -hmm. them. So what I did was 
I would looked at the themes and I made four chapbooks essentially, one with each theme. And then I tried to put them into a manuscript. And the minute I tried, they turned their backs on each other and said, no way, we don't want anything to do with this other stuff. And I, I couldn't figure it out. And I was sitting in Yorkshire then because I take my big projects and I spend time with them when I'm over there often. And every time I go there, I used to take John Clare's collected poems out of the library and I would keep them out of the library for the two and a half months I was there. I would never return them. They're just part of my worldview when I'm there. Hmm. And I'm saying to myself one day, you know, this is an absolutely lunatic idea. Why are you even thinking about this? It doesn't make sense. And then I thought, aha, because John Clare lived his entire adult life in insane asylums. And do you know what drove him insane? No. What drove him insane, yeah, well, it's really telling. It, what drove him insane was the way plants and animals were being treated in the 1830s and 40s, his time. And other things, but that in particular. That's interesting. I didn't know. I mean, so, so he's ahead of his time, even if he were living today, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Because the, you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And his poetry is unique. Nobody writes like him. I mean, it's conventional in the sense that it rhymes, but it's really not conventional at all in most ways. And I like it. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that he'd had this uh, escape from the asylum. He escaped one of these asylums and he went 80 miles in four days without a clue what the direction was. He was trying to get back to his home village where he mistakenly believed his childhood sweetheart was alive. And she wasn't. Oh, wow. But he didn't believe it. But so he had not a penny. And he ate grass the entire way. And he said that grass tasted like fresh baked bread. Hmm. And he slept rough. Yeah. And he got there in the four days, which is just an achievement. But I thought if I looked at this little prose diary, he took a journey. I'm taking a journey. Maybe I can find something that would give me a guidance. So I started looking through it. It's not very long. And the first thing I found was the motto for my life. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, really? Because I hadn't read that. I'd read the poems, never read that. So what it says is, and this is John Clare, it says, having only myself in my army, I led the way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's my life. Well, I've always been not, you know, so, yeah. so I, so he was my guide. Why, why is that your life? Like, why, why do you, you know, why do you feel oh, that way? Well, well, because both my parents rejected me. Oh, really? Um, because my brother and sister wouldn't play with me because my mother wouldn't let me play with hmm. any other kids at all. Or I never had a birthday party. Oh, wow. Um, I was, I was completely alone and my mother never stopped her attitude toward me and she used to tell me every single day nobody will ever love you Wow! every day and she would hit me in the face oh wow and my father would watch her and so i really was alone in my army and she never gave me a stuffed animal so i never had anything to hold i wanted a stuffed animal oh wow, wow. at night i never had one so i mean this sounds whiny i don't feel whiny at all but that's not the point the point is yes i grew up alone mm -hmm. and so I had to be strong and I found my life in books and pictures and it made me, they made me happy. Hmm. But I was taking, I didn't have any companions. I had no one to talk to. So it was just me. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Oh, wow. Does that make sense? It does. But, but that's such a tragic uh, thing to hear. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. And it reminds me of the, um, you know, there's all those studies with the monkeys and the, they have the, the mother who, um, you know, one's soft and one's metal and, and, and they prefer the yeah. the soft monkey to the metal one with food, you know. And so then, you know, poetry becomes your, your cushion and your food, too, I guess, or, or writing does. Um, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's well, yeah. I mean, as a child, books were my my happiness, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I love looking at pictures, so I'd get art books out of the library and look at the pictures. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I drew, and I did all this other stuff, so that's why. Yeah, yeah. And then I thought, yeah, so then I started looking to see if I could find any way in which his journey could shape mine, which I knew what the order should be, but I couldn't put them together. But I found quotes from him that made sense to me for each step of the way. And so that's why I, they weren't, the poems were not inspired by John Clare, which was what I would have thought if I'd seen the title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I would have thought it was a straight up history of John Clare or all kinds of mm -hmm. things. But none of that is the case. I'd written the whole thing long before I thought of using John Clare's journey as my own. But he fits and we go side by side. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm so grateful to him for helping me because I wouldn't have figured out how to do it at all without him. Yeah, that's so true. Like, like sort of like rhyming through time or something. Um, yeah, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Good, good phrase. Uh, well, do you want to read a few more poems from the book? Sure. Okay. Um, so let's see. And if you can say what page you're on, I can show it for everybody to read along. Oh, that's good. Okay, I don't know what I'm going to read. I should have planned this ahead of time, well, but okay. no, naturally not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I want to do um, Serenade because I like that one. So that's in the first section. It's on page 12. Okay. okay, it says, Soon your small yellow leaves will become meteors, falling through the dark as all of us must fall. No matter how hard we love, no matter how close we come to composing a line the angels would recite, if only there were such a perfect line, if only there were angels. Hmm. So that's one from there. I, I have to read a funny one at some point because um, I, was, I, I tutor at the library. I tutor adults in English. And I have this really lovely Italian woman who's just 40, just got her engineering master's. And she doesn't, her, anyway, I, I was invited to house at her, her house for dinner. And her parents were there who don't speak any English. And I speak some Italian, I, I fake it. Um, but in the middle of after dinner, they said, well, she said, well, tell, read us a poem. And I didn't have the book with me, but I know stuff by heart. And so I thought, I'll just do this one because it's coming up in a story. So she has this little girl who's eight and a little boy who's five and a husband. And little girl insisted on wearing her best dress because I was coming and everybody else was wearing jeans except me because I didn't realize they wouldn't dress like Americans. <laughs> so I dressed better. But, but it, was, it was too cute, this little girl. So I, I thought, okay, so I'll read this, this one because it's funny, maybe. So this is what I read, but the little girl... Uh, was so tickled that she said, would I read it again? And she memorized it. Hmm. And I was taking her, I've been taking her walking in the woods, teaching her about the plants and stuff. And she's a good little student. She's really interested. And I'll tell you afterwards what she said to me. So this is, um, <laughs> this is called Robert and Christopher up in a tree. Oh, you want the page, yeah, don't you? Yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah, 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 I can. I just forgot about it because I'm not used to looking at the book when I read. Hold on. Well, I can find it. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no problem. Uh, da, 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 da. 45. Okay, thanks. Yep. Of course, it always makes me nervous. I remember one time somebody bought this book of mine ahead of time, and she was following along with me in the book, and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, what if I make a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> I was sure I would, and I probably do. But anyway, Robert and Christopher up in a tree, it's called that, which poets will get this. It's very obvious that I stole Robert Frost's idea, and I stole Christopher Smart's idea. Mm -hmm. That's why. Okay, and so if I say something backwards, just ignore me, because I... I so it says, something there is that doesn't love a squirrel. For squirrels amuse their sharp little teeth by gnawing on my siding. For squirrels steal food never meant for them. And when I say, did you think you had wings? They just look up at me and go on feeding. For squirrels scrabble up the outside of my house and check me out through the window like bratty children. For I would enjoy blasting a squirrel. I would start with water cannon, and if that failed, then tear gas. For after that, I would fire a warning shot over its furry little tail. And après ça, le squirrel stew. For squirrels are not cute. For squirrels have no redeeming social value. For no matter how a squirrel dangles its little front paws at me and bats his beady eyes, I would never, ever marry one. <laughs> so so I, I said that backwards, but I don't care because that's the same poem. Yeah. It's a folk song. Yeah. Um, but so so she she liked it so much that as I'm walking through the woods, the squirrel runs across the, our path, and she says, you would never, ever marry one. <laughs> She's all pleased with herself. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's great. Oh, well, I have so a, cute. You know, we have a, in my yard back here, we have ground squirrels. And it, I just have such a, a uh-huh. hate, hate relationship with those things because they dig everywhere. <laughs> Uh, they do everything. Also, mine did, did eat my, does do eat my house. Mm-hmm. I mean, they eat the wood. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, they're, they're, yeah, they're little jerks. They kind of are, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Well, I, I've had my revenge by d- disrespecting squirrels, so... <laughs> So, so, so um, first of all, let me pass on something. Uh, Carla Schwartz um, says, hi, Lola uh, from Carla Schwartz. This is a regular viewer. She's, she watches most episodes. Uh, she says, you've come a long way since our days at UF in the 1990s. Congratulations on all your achievements. Your writing is a marvel. How nice. That's really nice. Um, huh. So, so let me ask about, you already, it's already come out that, um, you know, you memorize your poems, which most people don't do. And you've, you've already compared writing a book to like composing a symphony or something like that, or, uh, you know, yeah. to composing. Well, a piece of music, it depends. Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah. So, so how does that, how does that operate for you? Um, like, like, well, I mean, go ahead. Oh no, just, just. I don't know. Like, I don't know how I would go about writing music. Um, although poetry is music, there's a there's a way that it really is. Well, it, it's to me, it is exactly the same mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. But also, I mean, uh, but a book has a cadence to it, like a piece of music, you know. And it's like a novel too. I mean, it begins in a certain place, and then it rises, it falls, it has themes, mm-hmm. and so on, and then it it's different at the end. Mm-hmm. And I, and there are certain themes that I weave in like motifs Mm -hmm. you know like in music Mm -hmm. and things that recur they're they're images like in this particular book i think it's stars there are a lot of stars in this book Mm -hmm. and so and in fact uh when you get to the very last section there's the one that has stars called constellated Mm -hmm. and that that one um i'm you're nobody's going to get a sense of this book because i'm jumping around but it says con- it's called constellated, and I could t- I'll just. Do you want me to tell you what page it's on? Yeah, if you want. yeah. Why don't you go ahead and or read it? I can find it. It's toward the end, so I can just find it. You can jump right. Yeah, in. it's right toward the yeah. end. Okay. It says. Well, I'll wait till you find no, it good. so people can see. Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. When the atoms in my body return to stars, they will not remember this five a.m. out the window. Neither the moor asleep on the horizon nor across her darkened hips, the spatters of bright yellow course. So we end with the sky, mm-hmm. you see. Yeah. So in the way your life starts with the stars, right, and opens up into the sky when you, do, you, know, when you die, mm-hmm. it begins like that. When, and it's so that the first section, it's like a tail in the mouth. You know, the first section begins with death, and then this this is somewhat death, but then right after that we have this kind of exuberant, weird poem about redemption. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think about that. I really do. I think about the music. And also I think that in music and in poetry books, you need a place to sit down and be quiet. Mm-hmm. You can't stay mega intense all the way through the thing and have anybody not be able to breathe. So I put poems into my books, which are quieter poems, which don't require holding your breath, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's just such an interesting thing to think about. Like, I don't know anything about composing, but, um, but you know, when you're writing a poem, you get the first line and there's a way that the first line dictates what comes after because certain things rhyme, there's certain word shapes, there's certain images it, it right. sort of, mm-hmm. you know, it, it plays. I mean, I just don't know much about classical music, but but I know that there's like motifs that to. repeat, and and you know, like there are alterations on sort of a theme, and and that's really how a poem well, yeah, works. You know. you know, like you kind of, of you sort of, it is. yeah, yeah. Why do you think that is? And also maybe, well, maybe the first thing you thought of too is the last line. Mm-hmm. That's happened to me. I mean, I've had this line. I'm just going, oh, that's a great line. I'll start with that. But it's actually the end. Mm-hmm. It's where everything was working toward in the beginning. So do you realize so, that at the time and then write toward it? Or do you? No, you, yeah. no, yeah. no, no, my God. Are you kidding? I don't realize anything. Mm-hmm. I only know I'm, I know, only know it's right when I finish it or not. I mean, I throw out lots of stuff. Mm-hmm. If you're not willing to, you know, if you want to surf, go, don't. You gotta wait for the wave. Yeah, it's worth yeah, riding. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a great you way know? to say. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, so you wait. That's the way it works. I do. T- I really think. Also, the other thing is that, as far as music is concerned, I think a lot about the sounds of the words I'm writing in the poem. I want to weave the sounds like they're a tapestry. I want to sing the sounds so that you, if you saw me read, I, I don't stand still. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I want to sing them. And that's the other thing is that the whole book is it is writ large what I want to do in each poem. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it, it really does. Um, and I just I just like that concept a lot because I always think that um, I always say poetry, you know, the definition is that it's the music of human speech. And, and that's what poetry is um, or one of one of two things that it is, I think. The other thing is, is the opposite of propaganda. Those are the two things I think poetry is. Um, you know, because well, good poetry. But there's plenty of propaganda poetry. <laughs> there is, but I don't think it's real poetry. I don't think it's poetry. If it, unless it's, well, I, I agree with you there. Yeah, and, yeah, unless it's trying to express something that you didn't already know, you know, and you're 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 searching. It's a it's an act of seeking. It's a tool for understanding, and so if you already um, know what you're trying to say, then it's um, it's not poetry. It's propaganda. That's my opinion. Oh, I see. That's an interesting thing because to me, propaganda is something that the writer is attempting to convince you of exactly but yeah. if you don't have any intent mm-hmm. and you don't know what the hell you're doing yeah that, uh, that is poetry not convincing anybody <laughs> of anything yeah 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 uh, but you're, you're what a cool idea um, yeah well thank you <laughs> um, you're welcome um so do you want to read a couple more poems absolutely okay. sure i do okay let me see um i think i should read things that aren't like each other i'd like to read some of the really little tiny ones yeah, and make a series of yeah, books. yeah. Read a series of. Make sure you hit some of the prose poems too, because that's one of the things about the book that people should probably understand is that it's sort of organized by um, style almost as much as. Um, oh, it's totally organized. This one is organized by style mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah, so there are a lot of sections. I'd love to see one of those long ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's do. I mean, right now, just do the short ones that you want, but then come back to the long ones too for sure. Yeah, I'll do. I'll do the short ones that I want, and then I'll come okay, back. Sounds good. Okay, so. So we're on page, what? Um, I can't see it without glasses. So there we go. Okay, page 22. Okay, these these are just little tiny things. And actually, I'd like to do a couple from the page before, is it? Yeah, I'm going to do two from the page before, which is page 21, right before 22. Okay. Usually they come in that order. <laughs> so, okay, so because these two I wrote when I had this residency in Miami, for one night and two days. And I'm thinking, and it's this nice writer's room and everything. It was in a hotel, a fancy hotel, but the room was not fancy at all. It was definitely not fancy. And I thought, I can't write something in one night. I can't do that. That's just not what I do. Uh, and they had this cup with pencils in it, sharp pencils, and you know, those little tiny pieces of hotel note paper, you know, like the little like post-it notes. I thought, what the hell? So I did these two poems, which is really weird. So, I mean, I did three, actually, but the third one's not like them, so I did the two that go together. Uh, The first one had to do with the color of the sea. And it says, The sky loved the bay so much, he melted into her. Besides such devotion, we, with all our pride, are less than ants. Which is true. And the other one is, um, it's... I think I called it something like Ocean Drive, Miami. Maybe I did. It says, the hotel fronts pretend to be cake. Look out, Los Ninos are banging their spoons on the table. Because <laughs> it's just an invitation, right? The, you know what Los Ninos are, right? Yeah, yeah. The children. Those are the weather systems. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. What? Mm-hmm. No, we're not talking about children. We're talking about weather systems. Yeah, gotcha. Mm-hmm. La Nina and El Nino. Yeah. That's right. That's what I was thinking. Okay, so I'll do a few of these other ones. This is called Luckily Beauty. Mm-hmm. And it says, far above my head, an eagle crosses the dappled light and vanishes. No cry, no wing beat. Yet I looked up. So you could never have seen it. You might never have seen it. How beautiful that is. And then this next one's called Kindness. It says the sweet sweet gum reaches out from its roots on the hill to touch my window when it rains. I love that. You know, it does me this favor. It sort of rubs its little branch against my window when it's raining. It's just so gentle. Okay, what else was I going to do? Oh, yeah, okay. 
This is one fickle. The autumn leaves cling to each other in their drifts. The wind has abandoned them all. And then, let's see here, what else will I do? I don't want to do any of those. Okay, so this is um, loss. And I was telling somebody about this one because it's a friend of mine who's not interested in poetry, but he likes to be on the water. And I saw this across the lake. And he understood it, which is really great. It says, across the lake, the leafless trees have turned to smoke. And then I was kayaking off Cedar Key, which is an island off my part of Florida. And I found, after a hurricane, this printer. And so it's called Prost Traumatic. Traumatic. It says, a printer, half buried in the sand, intact, but mute forever. Because mm-hmm. to me, that's like post-traumatic stress. Okay, I'll do one more of these, and then I'll, I'll switch to the other genre. Okay, so every year there are these meteor showers, and I go to the darkest place I can find. You're so lucky to live on a mountain. Oh, I am. Because I don't get proper dark. Huh? I am, yeah. yeah. We, um, I'm trying to petition oh, our town I... to have a dark sky night as like an event every year, so everybody turns off their lights. Um, I haven't convinced Excellent everybody. Excellent idea. Yet. But, but I love taking the Why dog not? for a walk. I, after the show, I'll be taking the dog for a walk. At, well, it's cloudy tonight, but I'll be uh, every night oh. looking up, and I see shooting stars every night. It's, it's fun. Yeah, I know it is. Can I come? Yeah, yeah, you're always welcome. <laughs> walk the dog? <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> oh, so this is, this is the meteor showers, the Perseids. And it says, an eyebrow of light trailing a red cloud hisses out in the dark sky water on which still float a million stars. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so those are, are some of the small ones. Yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned um, you, that you memorize everything. And um, yeah, and I don't memorize it, I just know you it. You know it, yeah. But it's interesting because what you change up, if anything changes, is always just is the order of the images. Like it's, it's like you have the image of the poem or the scene of the poem or something and you're, and, and you're like retelling it, you know? And and maybe, you know... It's, well, it's fresh every time I do it to me. Hmm. I think that's maybe why. And sometimes, actually, there are two poems of mine. Um, let's see. One of them, let's see. I'm trying to think of which would be the shorter story. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they're both... They're not short enough. But anyway, one of them, um, I was talking about... It's It's a poem that actually saved one of my students' lives. Hmm. I literally, I mean... Well, tell that story. I think people want to hear that. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, okay, I can tell you. It's in another book. It's not in this one. Um, I did a lot of counseling when I taught computer science. I had my door closed, mm-hmm. and they had no one to talk to. And I know how it is to have no one to talk to, so they would come in and talk to me. And this girl came in, and she was over traditional age. She was probably 35. I wouldn't be surprised. Unusual at University of Florida at that time. And she didn't bathe. And I thought maybe she was a street person come in to get warm because I had 45 people in my class and I'd memorized their names, but at the beginning I wasn't sure. But I looked her up on the roll and she's in the class. So I, they used to come and get help with their programs because they can't fail if, I, if they come and ask because I'll show them. I will, I'll make them see it. I won't show them. But so she didn't come to me until the last program and she comes in and she has no program with her and she comes in, sits down, and she says, you know, I don't know why I'm telling you this, because there, I, not, you're not going to change anything. But I have the pills now, and I'm going to go home and take them. Hmm. Well, she didn't know that my very first boyfriend came to kill me, and he killed himself. Oh, wow. The first person I ever loved and who loved me came. Yeah. Uh, and I know about suicide. I know you can't stop anybody. I'm well aware of that. But I... I you know, and I could have called, I should have called, well, you're supposed to call student mental health and walk them over. And I, w- I would have done that. I s- tried it out and I knew it wouldn't work and it didn't. So I got her story out of her. And she had run away from home when she was 16 and joined the Krishnas. And then she got disillusioned and she didn't have anywhere to go because she couldn't go home. So she became a prostitute. Then she got addicted to heroin. And then, good for her, she kicked it. But she still had an, an abusive man. She had a string of them. 
And I, I could see that she had an abusive man, so she did. And she had nothing to live for. And the one reason she didn't want to live was that everything is predictable and then you die, so what's the point in going through it? Too painful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had this inspiration. I was so lucky because I never said anything like this before. But I said, okay, so will you do me a favor before you go? And she said, okay. So I said, what I'd like you to do is to get really quiet and watch yourself as a kid like you're watching TV. Mm -hmm. Just watch. Mm -hmm. And if you get to a point where you're happy, I want you to tell me what you're doing. Okay? Okay. So there's this long silence, and she says, okay. And I said, well, okay, what are you doing? And she said, I'm playing the piano. Well, I've written a book about piano, but this was way before that. However, I could tell by the way she said it. I said, were you any good? Mm -hmm. I could tell. She, she said she got picked to play on the symphony, with the symphony orchestra when she was 14 on the stage. And I said, okay, fine. So when you played the piano, did you play finger exercises, Hannon, finger exercises like this? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, so do you know why you played those exercises? And I didn't answer the question, and she didn't say anything, and she left. She understood what I was getting at, but she left. Mm -hmm. And I don't write occasional poems. I just don't. But the next day, I taught Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I just wrote down what I'd said to her. Mm -hmm. It was like carrying the version of Guadalupe in my wallet, which I do. And I'm not Catholic. But I just wrote it down. And I thought, you know, I, I thought, of course, you want to send the police after her. You want to call her up. I know better. I didn't even think of those doing those things. It wouldn't have worked. So I went to class the next day and I carried this piece of paper with me just because it felt like good luck. And I never expected her to be there. Hmm. Believe me, she was. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. So I put this down face down on her desk and I went up in front and taught the class. And she cried through the whole class, the whole class. I watched her just crying. And after all the students had cleared away from the front because the program was due and they were all anxious for help, she comes up and she has this piece of paper, this is true, in her hand, and she says, this is why I'm not going to do it. Mm. And I can't tell you what that meant to me. I mean, and I said, okay, so I'd like to see you every Monday. She came to me every Monday for the rest of the year, and I know she's okay. Mm. I happen to know. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen her in a long time now, but so I'll tell you the poem, and then I'll tell you what I did wrong when I put it in the book. But it's, um, it says, for someone considering death, it says, it's very straightforward. I told you, life is one big Hannon, up and down the piano, ten fingers skipping over each other in every conceivable way, two hands getting stronger. And sure, the notes are the same for everyone, but you can choose to whisper or shout, to fade or grow. And haven't you noticed? Some people's hands sing, but others are Midwestern on the keys, each crescendo a secretarial swell. Think about this. How can you dream to play the pathetique? How can the moment come for you to look into someone's eyes and say, the hell with everything, I love you, when you haven't done your time, hour after hour, year after year in that small closed room wow well that was beautiful that's um, the first time on the uh rattlecast i got a little little teary-eyed there <laughs> that was a beautiful poem and a beautiful well, story thanks for so much for sharing that lola you're welcome there's even more to it too originally i had I think I had five fingers skipping over each other in the book. I don't know why I ever did that, but I changed it to ten. But the second thing is that when I when the book came out, I had a Japanese student at the time at UF named Makoto, and he called me mom. He still calls me mom. He's, I don't know how many years later, 25, long time. Um, he called me from Tokyo to tell me he had had a child. He said, Mom, I want you to be the first in the world to know that I am father. And he went to strive the birth. It was so adorable. Oh, wow. But he called me one night at 3 in the morning. 
because he was there when I was reading from that book. It's Hunger, the book. Um, and he said, Mom, i got to know something. And this is three in the morning. I said, what? And he said, I want to know what it mean to play the pathetique. I explained it to him. And he said, thank you. He hung up. Two years later, he said, he was sitting at his kitchen table with a knife at his chest. Hmm. And he said, Mom, that poem, that poem saved my life. Hmm. That's twice. Yeah. That's just the most beautiful goddamn thing that ever lived. And if you know, if you never write another poem, who cares? Yeah. That makes it all worthwhile. And I was just lucky. Mm -hmm. No kidding. I was just lucky. I happen to know I was just lucky. But on the other hand, bless luck, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are two people who might have died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I didn't save him. It was the poem. I didn't do it, and I was lucky. Period. It was luck. Mm -hmm. But that poem means a lot to me because I think of them. Well, the 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 emotions there in the poem for sure. It's a great poem. I hadn't heard it before, so I'm glad, really glad you shared that. Well, thank you. So now we're going to go from the sublime to the book. Yeah, let's go back to the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I can do. So I, what I do when I do a reading is I usually read one or two because it comes out different if I look at it. And not just the order. I'm not talking about order. Usually I'm perf letter perfect, but I'm kind of messed up tonight. But I mean, it, but it makes it different when you look at it. It sounds different. So I'm going to read one, one of these guys. So would you rather, okay, you can choose. Okay. I'm going to give you a choice. Okay, so you can have St. Francoise. You can have Francis Jane. Um, I don't think some reflections on theater are mistakes because those aren't the same sort of thing. So the one of those two, or uh, yeah, one of those. Let's, two. let's do the love song of Francis Jane. Okay, good. I quite like that yeah, one me too. I, I remember that from reading it earlier. Okay, okay. So I'm going to read this one because this is my poem I'm reading for this this session here. I, I could actually do it. I always get when I start reading it, I stop looking after a while, but but I'm going to look at it. So look, I got glasses yeah. on. I'm looking at it. <laughs> Pretty exciting, huh? Okay. The Love Song of Francis Jane, and it's after Francis Jean, French poet. As my hours fold into twisting alleys, I want to choose a sheep to ride, as sheep have pleased me. I take my stick and scour the wide highways. When I find only cement and sooty air, dark as lambs born wrong, I become angry and say, oh, donkeys, my friends, I am Francis Jane, and I am going to heaven. And I will find moors there, broad as my body when it covers a man. And there will be skies there that are never simply blue, because good and evil will live in them equally. And there will be mosses there, seducing the high hollows in which I will sink to my thighs and feel I am drowning. And there will be tour tops there where everything has already been eaten, but still the sheep graze and grow fat. And the sheep there will not run from me, but allow me to ride them at my will. I am Francis Jane, and I am going to heaven. I will not live any more in this bowl as if I were something floating in soup. I will take only my feet and my stick, because I am half blind with this life and must tap my way. I will climb to where the stone houses fade and break apart in the wind. And I will stand at the top and turn to the four directions. And in each, my robe will stream behind me. Then I will look up at the one sky in which every flower of the field, every insect that crawled between petals or lifted up the ground, every small hair that craved another, every flat hand raised to hurt, has materialized and melted into something else. And I'll spin with wide arms. And when the world blends, I am Francis Jane, I will say. I am Francis Jane. And the God wind that never leaves the tops will blow back into my face everything I am and will be to you as I cover you with my nakedness and look into your eyes. And so that was... Um... The Love Song of Francis James from uh, Lola Haskins' new book, Asylum, from Pitt Press. Um, how how do those poems, um, you know, they're they're so they're so different from um, 
um, the shorter poems. Um, how does yeah how, I know do you do you plan on writing like that, or do they just come out in a different way? Like how do you decide how do you decide what well, what's going to happen? I, are you kidding? I don't decide. You don't decide either, do you? No, no. I mean, come on. I'm kind of leading you a little bit. Realistically, I don't yeah, decide. Yeah, Yes, you are. It's not going to work. <laughs> no. Um, I get on a roll with something, mm -hmm. and I get a certain eloquence going. I can feel the eloquence. Mm -hmm. And, oh, God, I wish I had. This is one I, I I would have to read, read, because I just wrote it, and I haven't. But it was so great. I was walking near Django's, my son's. He lives outside Chapel Hill, he lives outside Carborough, and walking in his neighborhood. And there were these, it's a beautiful leafy neighborhood, and it's next to fields, and it's hilly. And I saw these two women ahead of me, and they were very happy together. They were chatting, you know, and I could tell they were friends. And I had this just, just rush of thrill and thinking, oh, great, I'll get to be their age soon. <laughs> And they were 30 years younger than me, easy. <laughs> and I wrote a poem which explains why that's true. I haven't published that poem yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't even sent it out yet. I've had it a while, but it's my favorite poem maybe I've ever written. It solved the problem of time. Huh, wow. I love that poem. I, no, I'm not kidding. I am just so passionate about that poem. I almost don't want to send it out in case somebody disrespects it because it's the best thing I've ever written, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, for myself, it just solved everything i don't know why yeah. but it did what? so there's that but I, it's 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 i knew i felt the eloquence when i got going mm -hmm. is what i was going to say with these others like saint francois saint francois i i've had these ideas i was going to write a whole book of poetry about wine because i figure the vineyards would carry them mm -hmm. in a heartbeat in their gift shops and my sister has all these connections with with vintners and so I wrote the first one, which is, is fine. It's called The Invention of Champagne. Mm -hmm. And it says, the dark stones radiated dark. I oh, know the, the, wait, yeah, is that right? No, this, the, oh, I know, the damp stones radiated dark. Magia said the monk who had made a mistake. I am drinking stars, hmm. which I like. Mm -hmm. But I could never write another one that was worth a flip. <laughs> they were horrible. <laughs> I strained and stretched and... You know, I mean, I was going to write another series of saint poems, is my point, with saint, saint Francois de Coisson, you know. Mm -hmm. I was going to write a whole series of those, and I can't. Mm -hmm. I just can't. There aren't any more. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's because, um, you know, people were talking about my comment about propaganda before, but I feel like poetry is really a tool that you use to discover things you don't quite know or don't quite, you know, haven't quite put together. And, and that's why... Oh, that's absolutely and true. And so is but, it because but, that you, you sort of ran out of things that are mysteries? Is that why those, uh, you know, you couldn't go farther with the wine poems? Do you think um, it, it's a lack of, um, of know, mystery? Yeah, actually, it could be. Um, there's this poem. Um, let's see. Let me think about this. Um, okay, so there's this poem I wrote about philosophy. It's not my favorite poem of mine at all. It's been published, but it's... It's minor, but it, it makes the point. So it says, when I was young, I shunned philosophy because I could always see why each system could not be true. I wanted a system like a marriage that would stand by me because it promised. Hmm. Now, grown, I want something else. Give me a mist whose approaching figures could be anything. Give me a lover like a star. I don't think that's a great poem, but anyway, but the point was it makes the point. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I feel. Well, everyone wants you to read the poem about time. Are you sure you can't read that poem about? Well, i got to find it because I can't. Um, problem is I don't, I, I, I could. I have to get mm -hmm. it, though, because I have to, have to print it because, okay, can you wait yeah, a minute? Yeah, yeah, you can wait. We can wait. Okay. Everybody wants me to read the poem. Okay, yeah. I'm and happy I, to I do want that. to hear it too. So um, yeah, so okay. why don't you read right. that? And I'll hang um, on. yeah, hang on. I'll just talk to people. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah. So so um, yeah. What do you want to talk about? Uh, as Lola gets that book. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so to me, just to, to finish up. Um, that idea, because everybody's asking about how poetry can be like propaganda, and how um, um, there's a comment about where is it the isn't good advertising, um, doesn't it feel like you take the top of your head off? And what I'm talking about is the intentionality of the act of creation. 
I think that when you um, um, when you're writing something that's art, what you're doing is you're creating something new out of the chaos. You're, you're making some order out of the stuff you don't understand. And if it, if it's propaganda, you're doing, you're doing sort of the opposite. You're taking something you do understand and trying to project it onto everybody else. Uh, so that's what I was getting at. If it's something that you have intentionality where you know what you're trying to share, then it's um, propaganda. With using the word propaganda mm -hmm. is and the reason people are talking, uh -huh. I think is that propaganda has to do with manipulating people for evil ends. Well, usually. well, if you read a... And, and, and that's not what you mean. Well, if you read Edward, Edward Bernays' book, Propaganda, who you know invented the term, and it's a whole book about propaganda, there's good propaganda and bad propaganda. It doesn't matter if you have... Um, you know, uh, you know, if, if well, you're... That makes uh, sense, too. You know, like, Rattle is, is, is propaganda for poetry, where we're, we're trying to spread the idea that poetry is a good thing that too, you should right, be doing, right? But, but... Yeah. Rattle itself is not a poem because we're not creating anything. We're trying to spread an idea, and um, and and poetry is creating art. Just art in general is creating something new. And unless you're creating something that you didn't have before, then um, you're going in the opposite direction. It's a matter of where your intention is. The direction of your intention is what that that point is that I make. And I think you can you can feel it when you come across a poem that's a genuine. Or just any piece of art that's a genuine piece of art, you can feel the difference between somebody that's trying to give you a message oh, that they knew already I, yeah. versus something they had I, yeah, no idea I, what they were saying and they surprised themselves. You know, if no surprise yeah, for the I reader, mean, no judged surprise lots for the writer. Of contests and it's yeah. like that. Yeah, that's exactly lots how it is. Like and that. I feel like it's like somebody's manufactured mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and I feel uh, when I'm reading submissions to Rattle, I feel I, I use this metaphor all the time, but I feel like I'm flipping through a radio dial. You know, if you're flipping through a radio, you hear static, 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 and then you hear it come to a radio station, all of a sudden it's clear. And I feel like when you're reading submissions, all you're doing is listening for honesty. Um, and it comes through that clearly in an actual piece of poetry that's, that's, that's genuine art that's made with that intentionality. So that's what I was talking about, just to, to clarify okay. for everybody. Well, me. that's good. That's fair. Okay, I feel pretty shy about this now that I've said all that, but it means a lot to me, this poem. Yeah. Is all well, I have well, to we tell really, you. I really want to hear so, it, and everybody else does too, I think. So, so let's hear it. All right, well, okay, here you go. Okay. It's called The Discovery. Out walking in my 70s, down a leafy street, behind two women in their early 40s who are chatting to each other as companionably as birds on a limb, and having thought with happy anticipation, ah, I'll be their age soon. It occurs to me that I've lost my mind. But just then, the clouds evanesce and light pours through the oaks and ash to form lace, form lace on the pavement, lovely enough to be sewn into dresses. And I see that time is as random as the patterns the sun makes on any given day as it filters through leaves, and as illusory as a baby being born, and as strange as the years of our lives that go by without returning, and as equal as the one friend's auburn hair and the red leaf she steps over, which the wind has abandoned for love of her. And now, having finally seen that the world is every minute new, I realize that I'm only a little younger than those women after all. And I step between them, and we speak as we walk, and by the time we part, each of us in her own way has told the others how lucky she is to have been alive in such a beautiful place. Wow, yeah. Well, that, that is a great poem, Lola. Um, did you like it? I really did. I mean, it means mm -hmm. it means tons to me, so, of course, yeah. because I... Yeah, it, but, it, it definitely is. You know, speaking of that kind of sense of discovery, you could feel the discovery of an understanding of our place in the universe through that poem. Um, um, I, I wrote a, simple, he, he, a, a similar poem myself, um, and not in the same way, but I had this image all of a sudden um, as I was writing a poem one day, and I lost the poem. My computer, I don't know, at some point I just lost it. Oh, you're it. kidding. It wasn't a good poem. But the, uh, the idea, it came through just the act of creating a poem, is that if you were omnipotent, um, every, uh, any object, if you saw it from every angle at once, uh, would be a sphere um, of um, different various densities. Um, and so, so there's... The sense that you have to be um, cleaved from time in order to understand anything. I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a complicated concept, but the image of it well, is only in my head from writing that poem. Um, and, and I feel like the same kind of sense of discovery in that poem, too. 
Um, I feel that too. I can feel it as you're saying it. Plus, I've always thought that the only way that you can see something clearly is just look at it from every direction, mm -hmm. which isn't possible at the same no, time. No, no, yeah. So that's what's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, well, what it would be is a cloud of probabilities, which is what we all really are. Like, we're all ripples of probability. And in and, and God's imagination, uh, it's it, that concept, I don't know, it's, it's a hard to articulate concept. And the poem was terrible anyway, I didn't publish it. But it, but it was something that really shaped my understanding of the world. Um, and there, yeah, there's these there weird revelations that come through poems that are really um, amazing to, to experience. And I think that's why we're driven as writers to write. Um, and, and what I'm saying is, though, that that experience is definitely present in that poem you just read. I loved it. Um, I'd totally publish it if you ever wanted to. So... Uh, well, I could know. send it to you if you want. I mean, I've got, I've said it nowhere. Yeah. Well, just, well, if you want to, feel free. Don't hesitate. <laughs> okay, but you can't. But if I send it to you, you can't. You can't keep it a year and a half and say no. Well, thank you for submitting. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> no, no, I definitely won't. I definitely won't. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> well, it's, but I mean, but yeah, it's been so fun. Mm -hmm. I like to do this every week. I, I love doing this every week. Um, I think I might I know. even, you know, as we, um, if we end up being more quarantined for the coronavirus, I think we might do this even more often than every Tuesday night to kind of help people have something to do. But this is just so fun. Um, I love these no shows. Kidding. It really is. Um, I love that the way that just you get to meet a new poet every Tuesday. Um, and it's just and it's so spontaneous the way it works out. It, it is, yeah. It's just so fun. I love this this medium. It's it's so much. I, I love it more than you know. We used to have a reading series. I love it way more than the reading series. Um, you know, just because you get to talk too, and and you get to inter, you know people ask questions and uh, we all interact together. It's a whole you know two dozen people sitting well, around enjoying poetry all at once. Well, let me say something about whoever is listening out there. Thank you for listening very much. And I would like to be in the same room with all of you. I wish I were. Well, I think, so that's my final statement. You know, in a way, we kind of are. Um, but at 7 o'clock, do yeah, you want... Yeah, but I can't see Yeah, them. it's true. It's a, it's a one directional kind of thing. But do you want to finish off with like one last poem from the book, maybe, just to close it out? Um, okay. Do you have any idea what you think would work? Oh, gosh. That's a hard, yeah, that's see, a hard question. Let me throw this ball <laughs> back at you. Um, how about one of the... Let's see. Man, it's a hard, it's By hard the way, one. people, this book is a lot more coherent than I've made it <laughs> sound. Okay. Um. Oh, I know. I'll do one of the Moore poems. Okay. What, what, That'll work. What page? Um, this is, oh, let's see. I think I'll do, there are two of them. Yeah, I think I'll do Across the Tops, 68. Okay. Okay, this is one I know, so. Okay. Across the tops, our path runs narrow through heather, whose purple sprigs being September's are mixed with brown. A bleak sacramental wind cleans us for the Rilston Cross and the miles that may remain unto us under this dark gray roiling sky whose blue patches open and close in a blink. May no step we take go unnoticed. May we mark the whir and complaint of each flushed grouse. And may we glory in the cold forever. For it is the cold of the sea, of grass and heather and birds and sky. And most of all, the breaking light that gleams wild and holy in our eyes. That was Across the Tops by Lola Haskins from her new book from Pitt Press, Asylum. Um, Lola, thanks so much for joining us. It's just been such a pleasure, um, and we should definitely do it again sometime. Um, it's really great to talk to you yeah, and hearing your poems that. again. Yeah, thanks so much for, for joining us. Hope you have a great night. Thank you. It was really fun. Okay, bye. Bye. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was Lola Haskins. Um, reading from her new book, Asylum, from Pitt Press. Um, if you want to find more about Lola Haskins, it's lolahaskins.com. That's L-O-L-A Haskins, H-A-S-K-I-N-S.com. Now, um, I told somebody, we don't have a whole bunch of open mics going, but this is the open mic portion of the show. And um, if you would like to join in the open mic, we have, um, let me put the number up. Um, the phone number is 818-850-7727. Or you can send me a chat message over Skype to Rattle 
poetry, all one word, and uh, just send me a message, and I will um, and I will uh, call you when the time is right. We have two poems, poets lined up who wanted to go on. Joshua Corwin's here for the first time in a while. I guess he um, hadn't been free lately uh, on Tuesday nights, but he's back, so good, good, could be good to see him in just a minute. I also told somebody I would call them, so I have to make sure not to um, say the number out loud as I type it in. But we're going to call up um, a poet who sent... Um, let me find it. Um, this is Paloma Capana. Um, she's the author of Nearly 50, a collection of essays on how to cope through the messy, unscheduled bits in life. Um, and she's won the a bunch of awards, but one of them is the 2020 North Carolina Poetry Society Second Place for Poetry of Witness. And she wanted to share that poem with us uh, right now. So I'm going to call her up, and she's going to read it to us if she answers the phone. Um, we thought we'd try to do it this way. So now I have to dial. Um, if I can find the number. Hang on, just bear with me a second. And I'm not going to say it out loud as I type because... I shouldn't. Let's see if she answers. The phone is ringing right now. Oh, hmm, it didn't work. Let me try one more time. And if you're watching, um, uh, you're watching live. You get to see me try to do stuff like this. If you're if you're listening over, um, you know, on, on iTunes or any other podcasting platform, I'll I'll cut this stuff out of the audio as we wait to try to connect with people. Um, hmm. We got the number right. I got the number right. Oh, it's not working. So. Let's see. Maybe we'll try this. Uh, we'll try to connect again, or maybe I'll have her send audio for next week, maybe, because for some reason she's not answering the phone. Hmm. It says the number is invalid. Well, you know what? I will call, uh, let's call Joshua Corwin right now. And um, and I'll try to look up, make sure I got the phone number right. I, had, I did write it down by hand. Let's see. So now we're calling up Joshua Corwin, who's a, used to be a regular guest. Um, hey Josh, uh, hang on one second. Just cut off your, uh, you know, cut off the uh, stream so it doesn't doesn't echo, and I'll pull you right in. Um, let's see. There you go, Josh. Record. Let me get you so you're not huge. Hang on one second. One okay. second. Shrinking your video down. Shrinking your video. There you go, Josh. Record. How how's it going? It is going really great. It's glad to uh, glad to be back. Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, really yeah, nice to see you again. So you, you've just been busy yeah. on Tuesday on Tuesday nights, but um, but you used to call it yeah, a whole bunch. I have uh, quite a lot of really cool stuff going on. Like um, I'm gonna have with uh, Baxter Daniels Inc. Press slash International uh, Word Bank. So my book about uh, autism, addiction, sobriety, and spirituality. Uh-huh. So that'll be coming out with a release on 420. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, I talk a lot about uh, autism and marijuana addiction. And mm-hmm. what's great is that I get to help people mm-hmm. um, by working with this nonprofit organization called The Miracle Project. Uh-huh. And we're putting together, um, you know, the first ever, at least to my knowledge for that, the first ever um, poetry class for neurodiverse individuals mm-hmm. recovering from addiction. Yeah, and mm-hmm. we're do, using that as a way to kind of like as a channel to help get people to express themselves mm-hmm. and then have a reading. So it's just really cool stuff. Super looking that, forward to it. When you when you say um, marijuana addiction and um, and autism, is there a connection between the two? Like, are more autistic people um, yeah, um, I, addicted I, to I marijuana actually, than the general population yeah, or something? Yeah, I like that? actually. As a matter of fact, like somebody even had me ask me for uh, to like help them for like their something like a PhD student or someone mm-hmm. for one of their things of interviewing me about that. Um, and yeah, there I found that it makes sense that particular connection mm-hmm. because if you think about it, that there's a lot going on sensorily. That's exactly um, what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah it never exactly. occurred to me, but it so seems like a self medication. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. yep. 
yeah, yeah. I don't know how much the, of it there is mm-hmm. on that particular, uh, you know, thesis of working on that, but it just makes logical sense. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. glad that, that makes sense to you as yeah, well. Yeah, it really does. Well, what do you have for us tonight to share? Yeah, so uh, I have one of two things, and I guess you, you can choose. Um, there's this poem called uh, It Will Follow You Home, which I wrote with my eyes. Um, there was this individual who um, had me write like with right and left hand and kind of facilitated me writing it, and it was published in something in, in Spectrum Publishing recently for Pasadena. Mm-hmm. Or I could do like just a couple stanzas of this six page poem about the political polarization of uh, the country and the rise of Donald Trump. Let's and do, how let's do the right, the, the right and left hand. I'm so sick of Donald Trump. I, if I never read another Donald Trump poem again, uh, but let's, let's hear the right and left poem. <laughs> um, that sounds okay. good. Yeah. I've been, I've been writing a, um, working on a second book. Uh, it's about, uh, history told by a bullet. So hmm, I've been writing in certain styles of uh-huh. Ginsbergian lately. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Okie dokie. This is, it will follow you home. My body is a cleric of God rotating throughout the journey of becoming a space of darkness is a growth point. I say point because it can't be understood. A point is a concept, just like my body. So I pretend my linearity enclosure with a whistle of a hand that is a growing. I say growing because it comes full circle. The ENSO of existence is a growth point, QED. It can't be spoken, but it can be relayed. Enlarge, my friend. And never go back and hide your erasure. Reason can close the door wide open. The broken can ignore the stream, but only in the love of forgiveness it is with you forever, my friend. Don't forget it. Letting go can have side effects of knowledge in the four fright. There's fright in this big bad world of forgetting. It is like tying your shoes with the birth of Christ and all the saints of becoming in your heart of hearts. Let in the callousness because growth is helping mold. So please fall deeply and let me climb in. Your shell is a becoming, like the cleric within. There is a darkness in this state of letting. Crimson tides turn gravity into auras of purple colors, likened to a goddess. She is coming. Yes, she is coming. She is coming in her gown, in her righteous blossoming loquacious silence speaking an ignorable brightness to a righteous after the glow of the lifeline begins to fainten and drape into the clouds of becoming vulnerable as snow upon mountain's breath there is sunshine in this mountain i can feel it in your wind love the calling card of justice its ins and outs and the ocean cosmic and vulnerable bricks of mortar valley peaks of birds and viola geese bodies in the wilderness of love obstinate exit never-ending bliss thank you for you have given me light and magic in this nest of yours above, clapping each moment with continuation. Let it never end. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Joshua, for sharing that. It's really good to see you. Um, And I hope you get to, do you have Tuesdays off now again? Or um, is it just a one-time thing? 
Awesome. Yeah. By well, the way, if you happen to be in the LA um, area, if you happen to be, if the coronavirus hasn't got us, um, <laughs> no, I'm going to be actually, uh, I was asked to read Baraka. Uh, uh, that's what the piece is about, the political polarization. Uh-huh. It's a six-page piece, um, uh, co-feature with Alyssa Matuchniak at uh, Vox Hollywood. Oh, cool, um, cool. For this Saturday, so never been, mm-hmm. but it's... Can't turn it down. That's you cool. Know? Yeah. Well, well, break a leg, Josh. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Hey, good to see you again. Peace. Peace. Good night. Yes, that was Joshua Corwin. Um, if you'd like to call in, like Joshua did, all you need is Skype. Um, Skype is just a free app, uh, and every sort of modern phone or computer has it. Um, well, just download the Skype app for next week if you don't have it now, and then send a chat message to me at Rattle Poetry. You can also call 818-850-7727 and just do it over the phone. Um, But uh, since we could come up with, we'll have to do Paloma next week. I don't know what uh, the situation is with that, but uh, she wasn't answering the phone. I don't know if I dialed it wrong. Um, But we do have, um, we also have our um, uh, Megan's weekly prompt. And um, so let's get get to that. Um, Let's see. Oops. Um, where is the, there we go. Here's Megan's, Megan's weekly prompt. And, um, last week it was an addiction to soap operas, suggestion epigram. So it's supposed to be short and witty. Um, and I had the hardest time, um, I had the hardest time, um, writing an epigram. I've never tried to write an epigram before. People always, um, say like, you know, why don't poets write epigrams anymore? And apparently it's because they're really really hard so so megan's megan's prop was an addiction to soap operas i was thinking of the coronavirus and people um washing their hands all the time so so my little attempt and this is just stupid but it is what it is uh, here we go this is at the soap opera in the time of coronavirus it ain't over while the fat lipid clings there you go that's uh at the at the soap opera in the time of coronavirus and uh and megan's um little epigram uh was uh here we go this is megan's an addiction to soap operas this was when we're watching as the world turns at least we're not watching as the world burns there you go two oops i keep doing that two epigrams um and uh if you would like to write your own and have uh us read it on screen, all you got to do is send an email to openmic at rattle.com, or you can use uh, submittable, put prompt in the subject line so I know it's the prompt for the week, and make sure you send it by Monday night. And um, if you include an audio file, like some people do, I'll definitely read it on air. Uh, and if you don't, and you know, I'll read a few every week. This week, um, I don't know what, maybe it was because epigrams are so hard, but we didn't get any people sending in this week. Uh, we had a whole bunch, I think last week we had too many to, to read, I think... We only read like half of the ones we were submitted, um, but this week nobody sent one in. So um, maybe epigrams are just too hard. It was really hard. Like I um, was trying to think of something, <laughs> something witty to say, and I just it just that's kind of not how writing works, or at least how poetry works for me. So anyway, next week's prompt, uh, which will be a little easier, I think. Uh, but here's next week's prompt from Megan. This is a motel with no windows. Must use the words descent and twin so it's next week's prompt uh, a motel with no windows must use the words descent and twin so um once again if you would like to write a poem uh, just send it over here by monday night and um and i will read it on air or uh, you can send audio or you can call in uh, using the various methods that we have uh, the phone or skype Um, There's a whole bunch of options to participate, so I hope you do, because I think writing is really important, and I'm trying to get back on the saddle again and um, and write at least one little thing a week, although um, I I don't think I'll be doing epigrams again. Um, (laughs) But anyway, um, I should say before we go, uh, Rattle's a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry and unaffiliated with any other organization. We're just here because we love poetry. We've been publishing since 1995. Uh, We don't even charge for submissions. We don't ask for money at any point unless you want to subscribe in print because 
paper costs money and ink costs money and postage costs money. But otherwise, everything is free because we just love poetry here at Rattle. So I hope you um, love poetry too and share and, and click the like button and tell your friends to watch these broadcasts or to um, subscribe on YouTube or iTunes and all that good stuff. Click the notification bell so you uh, remember when we're live and get desktop notifications and all that. Now, next week, we have an excellent show. Every It's a great show every week, but... You know, what can you say? Next week is also a great show. Ellen Bass um, is one of the, really one of the great contemporary poets. Um, she was interviewed in round number 40. She has a new book out called Indigo. Um, I haven't read it yet, but um, I love her work and um, we should love this book. And I hope you join us next Tuesday, March 17th, the same time, 9 p.m. Eastern um, for Ellen Bass. But in the meantime, I um, hope you have a great night and I will see you soon. Good night.